All right, thanks, praise team. Especially good to see Val up there singing. Glad that you're home for a little bit. So I need to uh, apologize right out of the gate for my uh, sniffling and coughing. Allergies have overtaken my life this week. So I have two best, my two best friends with me today, Kleenexes and cough drops. So I should be good to go, right? So um, we're going to continue talking through um, and working through the book of Esther. And I want to share with you, um, if you've looked at your outline on the back, share with you a very extended um, point, I guess, but I think it's pertinent for what we're going to be talking about this morning. A um, couple points. Lamentations 3, 22 and 23. Because of the Lord's great love, we are not consumed, for His compassions never fail. They are new every morning. Great is your faithfulness. In Ezekiel 33, verse 11. As surely as I live, declares the Sovereign Lord, I take no pleasure in death of the wicked, but rather that they turn from their ways and live. So, lately, mornings, confession time, lately mornings have been a real struggle for me. Mostly because, I guess just the waking up part is the big struggle. Can anybody resonate with me? Um, but Emily and I both say that we love when we get up in the morning because we love being up early, but the waking up part always gets in the way of that. Maybe it has to do with what happened the day before, or maybe the night was just rough, or maybe it's what I have, what I have to do the next day that is causing me to uh, be a little um, recessive in getting up. Then um, the day comes after the struggle of waking. And to my surprise, some days turn out pleasantly different than I expected them to. Other days, they turn out dismally different than I expected them to. But the question can be asked, am I experiencing my day as Haman is experiencing it? Or am I experiencing my day as Mordecai is experiencing it? If you're not familiar with Esther, those are two people in the book of Esther that we're going to be focusing on this morning. Am I failing or embracing Lamentations 3, 22 and 23 each day? With knowing that the compassions of God are new and he gives them to me every morning and they're exactly what I need. Am I failing or embracing that? Do you fail or embrace Lamentations 3? I think our answer to that question will be based on how we react to the conversation that we'll have working through Esther 6 this morning. Are we living with a Haman kind of day, a Haman kind of week, Haman kind of month, missing the compassions that God is laying before us? Are we living with a Mordecai kind of day, week, or month, receiving all of the compassions that God is pouring out on us. The struggle we face is trusting in the providence of God that he has everything under control. We will see his providence very strongly in this chapter in very pivotal ways. This is a turning point moment in both Haman and Mordecai's lives. We'll walk through our belief with what God has, what God does with the little details of our life. We'll talk about the motivation behind our heart and what we do when we hear God speak. A good resource, if you want another resource other than what Todd has already told you, um, some good resources, is a book called Be Committed by Warren Wees Wearsby. Um, and I used that as some of my background and my study 
and that's guided some of our conversation today. Uh, but I want to dive into Esther 6. So if you haven't turned there, um, I would like for you to. If you don't have a Bible with you today, there should be some on the ends of your pews. Uh, make sure you use that. And if you don't have one of your own, take it home with you. It's a gift from us to you. We'll start out uh, reading verses 1 through 5 this morning. Esther 6, 1 through 5. That night, the king could not sleep. So he ordered the book of the Chronicles, the record of his reign, to be brought in and read to him. It was found recorded there that Mordecai had exposed Bigthana and Teresh, two of king, the king's officers who guarded the doorway, who had conspired to assassinate King Xerxes. What honor and recognition has Mordecai received for this? The king asked. Nothing has been done for him, his attendants answered. The king said, who is in the court? Now Haman had just entered the outer court of the palace to speak to the king about hanging Mordecai on the gallows he had erected for him. His attendants answered, Haman is standing in the court. Bring him in, the king ordered. So on your outline, if you're following along with that, um, here's what you can fill in. God cares about and orchestrates the little details of our lives. God cares about and orchestrates the little details of our lives. We see in the first five verses of Esther, of Esther 6, five instances that God's providence and proof that he cares about the little things of our lives. Stay with me. These are some awesome things. I can imagine that a king with Xerxes' personality and just demeanor um, wouldn't have many sleepless nights. Let's just say it that way. Because of his selfishness, because of his um, uncaring, um, he would have the ability to just do whatever he needed to do to, do to, get, to allow him to have a restful night. So I would, I would assume that there probably wasn't many unrestful nights that he had. But this night was different. Could Esther's mysterious request have been keeping him up? Or was it God allowing that request to keep the king up for a specific purpose that night? God's providence comes in unique ways through the most unlikely of people. Wiersbe recalls a sign at a zoo that he was visiting. It said, while you are sleeping, nature is busily at work keeping the balance of life stable. He recalls thinking that as I sleep, God is busily at work making sure the new day is just as he wants it to be. And this night was no different. Because then we see God's providence at work again with the king's entertainment choice, right? Right? The king could have had anything that he wanted to get him back to sleep, right? He could have had um, music, he could have had games, dancers, whatever, fill in the blank. But he chose to have a story read to him. Not just any story, he had the court minutes read to him. Sounds like a nice story to me. <laughs> Only God would have allowed the king to choose that type of entertainment to get him back to sleep. Not only that, though, it was the exact minutes that were read um, in a very vital time in the king's life with almost 12 years worth of minutes. The exact book and the exact page was read with Mordecai's life-saving tip that happened five years earlier. Isn't it amazing that God orchestrated the exact portion to be read? But others in history also have had life changes because of God directing them to read certain things or certain portions of a book. This man read and rejected a book called uh, Fantates. I think I'm saying that right. I hope I'm saying that right. By George MacDonald. 
Um, he re read it and rejected it. But ultimately, this led to C.S. Lewis's conversion. In another instance, a young man who sought peace in all the wrong places and felt miserable heard another young boy saying, pick it up and read. This man read Romans 13, 14 through, 13 through 14, which basically said, stop running after the things that gratify the flesh and clothe yourselves with Christ. Anybody know who this man was? St. Augustine, one of the great Christian theologians. Can God provide what we need through books to guide what he desires to happen? Absolutely. You see, the section that the attendant read said that nothing was ever done to reward Mordecai for the good deed that he had did, that he, that he did. And this was very unusual for this to happen because in Persia, they had a very uh, sensitive and, and, it, and they really adhered to a strict system of rewards and punishments. So for him to go this amount of time without being rewarded was very, very unusual. Is God in the business of redirecting schedules to allow his plans to be accomplished? You bet. Wiersbe says that God's delays are not God's denials. God's delays are not God's denials. We need to keep in mind that we only get an undetermined amount of puzzle pieces at a time. Whereas God has the whole picture of the puzzle in front of him. God gives as much time as he can to those who refuse him because he desires them to turn in repentance toward him. He wants us to be patient so that we receive the right reward that he has planned for us to receive. One final view of God's providence is Haman's immediate availability. Proverbs 6.18 says this, that a heart that devises wicked schemes has feet that are quick to rush to them. Was it a coincidence that Haman was the first official the attendant saw in the court? Not at all. Haman wanted permission as early as he could in the morning to hang Mordecai because of him not bowing to him and, this, and the, Jewish, um, the Jewish people not adhering to the king's uh, rules. But God turned his, de his destruction tactic into God's victory. The man who wanted to carry out the death of Mordecai, get this, would soon be the man carrying out the king's order to honor Mordecai. But that's a turn of events. I don't know what is. The man who, or, though, through the whole night in the morning, God worked through the little details of sleeplessness, the right book, the right people, to allow the course of Mordecai's life and the lives of all those Jews in that region to be changed. These five instances are proof to us that God can work through anything to allow God's plan to succeed. Not only that, but it proves to us that he cares about, he cares about us to the extent that he arranges the little things, like reading a specific page of a book to bring about life-altering game changers. What little things is God doing in your life right now or recently has done that were game changers to help you see his plan unfold in your life? Let's continue reading. Verse 6. 6 through 10. When Haman entered, the king asked him, what should be done for the man the king delights to honor? Now Haman thought to himself, who is there that the king would rather honor than me? So he answered the king, For the man the king delights to honor, have them bring a royal, a royal robe the king has worn, and a horse the king has ridden, 
one with a royal crest placed on its head. Then let the, ro- let the robe and the horse be entrusted to one of the king's most noble princes. Let, let them robe the man the king delights to honor and lead him on the horse through the city streets, proclaiming before the king, this is what is done for the man the king delights to honor. Go at once, the king com- commanded Haman. Get the robe and the horse and do just as you have suggested for Mordecai the Jew, who sits at the king's gates. Do not neglect anything you have recommended. A point. What side of the comma do you live on? What side of the comma do you live on? You're probably thinking, what, in the, what, what kind of point is that, right? But I want to help you see the importance of that point with a couple verses found in Proverbs. You guys can write these down. Proverbs 18, 12. Proverbs 29, 23. Proverbs 18, 12. Proverbs 9, 29, 23. This is 18, 12. Before his downfall, a man's heart is proud, comma, but humility comes before honor. 29.23, a man's pride brings him low, comma, but a man of lowly or humble spirit gains honor. You see, in both these verses, a comma separates two specific people, the proud and the humble. With the proud, we see words like downfall and bring low. Pride, when used selfishly, as Haman did, is toxic to our lives. In the short run, it may seem great to have that approach to life. Most things that Satan tempts us with and plants in our minds and hearts seem great in the short run. But in the long run, it only brings destruction and ruins lives. But on the other side of the comma, we see humility. Mordecai displays the essence of the Proverbs verses. His spirit of humility, patience, and trust allows life and honor to be brought to him. If we have a spirit of humility, God honors that with life and victory. Verses 6 through 9, we see Haman displaying the epitome of pride and selfishness through the extravagant answer to Xerxes' question of how to honor a man. It probably didn't help that the king invited him into his bedroom, something that doesn't happen every day. But it also probably didn't help that the king asked him his opinion about something. His ego would have been bigger than this room could hold, no doubt. Haman thought it could only be him because of all that he has done for the kingdom. And his revelation to Xerxes about the disobedient people group, Haman's people. It could only be him, right? It could only be him. Verse 10 creeps in, though and completely turns Haman's world upside down. Not only is Haman not going to be riding on the horse, but he would be carrying out all the things that he recommended to be done to a man that should be honored. It would somewhat be bearable if it was some other person, but it had to be Mordecai. And his worst nightmare just came true. You see, Haman was going to ask the king to hang Mordecai in this very meeting, more than likely. Now, though, he would be leading him through the city, shouting, this is what is done for the man the king delights to honor all day. (laughs) Haman has to be in shock. Mordecai probably confused. What's going on? We see, though, that this is the first time in Esther where Xerxes labels Mordecai as a Jew, and I think that's kind of significant. Could this be an oversight of the edict that was issued? Remember what 
the edict was that destruction would come to all the Jews at this certain time? Or could Xerxes have, a, have had a little bit of integrity, just a little bit, and actually followed through with something that he needed to follow through with to honor someone? Could it have been God that did that? For whatever reason, this decision to honor the Jew with the looming destruction of them certainly has God's fingerprint all over it. God's providence is perfect in all its ways. So again, I would like to pose to you this question. What side of the comma do you live on? Do you approach things with a sense of pride and entitlement or with humility and patience? That question might rub you the wrong way. It does me at times. But it's one we must answer with integrity and pursue a change if necessary. Let's finish up. 11 through 14. Guys ready? So Haman got the robe and the horse. He rode Mordecai and led him on horseback through the city streets, proclaiming before him, this is what is done for the man the king delights to honor. Afterward, Mordecai returned to the king's gate, but Haman rushed home with his head covered in grief and told Zeresh, his wife, and all his friends everything that had happened to him. His advisors and his wife, Zeresh, said to him, Since Mordecai, before whom your downfall has started, is of Jewish origin, you cannot stand against him. You will surely come to ruin. While they were still talking with him, the king's eunuchs arrived and hurried Haman away to the banquet Esther had prepared. Ready for the point? When God sounds the alarm, it pays to stop, look, and listen, and obey. When God sounds the alarm, it pays to stop, look, and listen, and obey. So Haman did exactly what he was told. And the irony is that Haman is telling others to do the very thing that Mordecai would not do to him. Bow down. I want us to go back a minute to the, the Proverbs verses that we uh, looked at to distinguish the proud and the humble. We see the reactions from Haman and Mordecai after, being, after the honoring was completely... Um, was complete, resembling a prideful person and a humble person. For you see, the person that we are will determine the reaction we have to good and bad circumstances. A very important thing to note is the reaction that both men had. Mordecai reacted by going back to his gate to man his post. There was no show, there is no extravagant reaction, simply gratitude and thankfulness from this humble man. God honors those that he can trust on the front and back end of honor. Mordecai's humility was a part of his character. Haman, on the other hand, didn't handle the situation very well. He was plagued with humiliation, probably more internally than externally, and this situation crushed his pride. Because you see, his pride probably was based upon his office. He was famous because the king said he was famous. Because of his wealth, because of his reputation, because of his authority. This was seemingly all stripped away when he had to lead the honoring of Mordecai. Haman is mourning over this life-altering turn of events. Verse 12 says that his head was covered in grief. But not only was he mourning these life-altering events, I think that he was mourning the fact that Xerxes labeled him as a Jew and claimed that. It makes me wonder if Haman knew what God promised to Abraham or if 
he knew a little bit about Jewish history. If he knew what he's up up against, that would make me mourn a little bit too. This is reinforced by what his friends and his wife says to him. They, They say to Haman that you cannot stand against him because of his Jewish origin. He will come to ruin. God was sounding the alarm for Haman. God was giving a warning to Haman loud and clear through his wife, through his friends, through how he felt. Heeding these warnings should have brought him to a place of humility and repentance and would have probably saved his life. But instead, he was ushered away to the second banquet where his fate would be revealed. Are you hearing any alarms from God? Are you listening to the alarms or are you you ignoring them as Haman did? Hearing and heeding to God's alarms depends on our character. If we have a desire to follow God and do what he says, we gain a divine mind and a heart that allows us to heed those warnings much easier, trusting that God knows best. If you don't, the warnings given may be confusing and unhandy because your heart may be in the wrong place. God wants everyone to turn from selfishness to wholeness. You guys ready for some challenges? I said challenges within, that's plural, because I think you guys can handle it. I've only given you one whenever, every time that I've spoke to you, but now I'm going to give you three. Can you handle it? Good. I want you to look for one area in your life this week where God has orchestrated a little detail. Look for one area this week where God orchestrates, has orchestrated a little detail. And when you see that, know that that is one small piece to a larger puzzle that God is putting together. I want you, challenge two, to decide which side of the comma you're living on and actually live there. Decide what side of the comma you're living on and actually live there. What a difference that will make for the third challenge. I want you to listen for an alarm that God is setting off in your life. Maybe it's a new alarm. Maybe it's one that's been going off for years. The only way to make the third challenge easier is is to decide to live on the humble side of the comma. When we recognize the little things that God does as a piece to a huge puzzle, when we choose humility over pride, we set ourselves up for God to be able to use us mightily without us even knowing it at times. It takes surrender. It takes trust. For he loves us, and it it never runs out. (coughs) Excuse me. Every morning, his compassion is towards us, are new. They are exactly what we need for this moment in our lives. And he desires for everyone to come to repentance and live. Can you pray with me? God, we're so thankful that you call us to live a life that's above reproach. That's a life full of humility. Help us to live that way. Help us to see the little things that you're doing in our lives that cause a huge difference, that make a huge difference. Be with us this week as we're challenged to think through our lives and how we live. Pray this all in your son's name. Amen.
please stand and join us in singing hymn number 327, Great Flat Babies. Thank you. 